Simon Atik, and you are the Senior Vice President of Mortgage Lending. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Yeah, no, you had it right, actually. Uh, Simon Atik, uh, I'm Senior VP um, at Guaranteed Rate Affinity. Um, and uh, I, I've been in this business for, gosh, what seems like forever, but uh, I've been in finance for actually 27 years, and I've been in, in the mortgage business for about 12 years. Amazing. Well, yeah. I'm so happy to have met you at Coldwell Banker. And what is your affiliation with Coldwell Banker? How, how did that all come about? Yeah, so the uh, uh, the Guaranteed Rate Affinity is a joint venture between uh, Guaranteed Rate, our parent company, and Anywhere Inc., which is the parent company uh, for Coldwell Banker. Um, so you can think of us sort of as the mortgage arm for Colo Banker offices, right? Okay. Uh, Colo Banker um, is one of many entities owned by Anywhere Inc. And they have title companies, escrow companies, multiple brokerages as well. Um, and we happen to be the uh, the joint venture that offers mortgage services to uh, to all the Colo Banker offices. Amazing. So when I have a client and they need a lender, I can refer them to you. That's right. Exactly. Yep. Fantastic. Well, let's get right to it then. The interest rates today uh, seem still pretty high. Uh, do you want to tell us where they're at today? Um, sure. Yeah. Today, last I checked, at least uh, the 30 year fixed was tracking right just below 7%. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, it's, we've kind of had this ping pong effect for some time now where we're following the 10 year treasury. Uh, we're looking at the Fed rate, of course. Um, and, you know, the 30 year fix has gone, you know, from six and a half to seven and a half with recently, at least. So pretty, pretty wild swings, depending on the day of the week. Uh, but on average, we, we've been sitting at around 6.7 to 7% for, for a little while. So I want to focus our conversation today on first time home buyers. And just being a first time home buyer as it is, is a terrifying experience. Uh, what should they be fearful for right now if they wait too long to buy a home? Yeah, so that's uh, a good question. And that's probably the number one question I get asked in this market is, hey, should I buy? You know, should I wait? Or, you know, I work with a lot of agents, obviously, and, you know, they're asking me, how do I how do I get my buyers to understand the market better to feel more comfortable that that they should move forward in, in buying right now? So. You know, one of the challenges we have is we moved from a very low interest rate market to a high interest rate market in a very short amount of time. So it wasn't a gradual buildup. And so that shock value certainly is is still impacting a lot of a lot of people uh, because, you know, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that, you know, a normal market has an interest rate of, you know, two and a half, three and a half percent, which is what we had during the pandemic. And the reality is, it's just not the case, right? Two and a half percent, three and a half percent on a thirty-year fix is just is not a normal market. That is a a, a very you know unique situation um, based on the Fed's trying to stimulate the economy because of the pandemic. And so, you know, people who are waiting for those rates to come back down are going to be waiting a long time because that's likely never going to happen again in our lifetime, right? So that's that's the first issue. Um, but with that, even with that, you know, people are so hyper focused on the interest rate itself that they don't realize what does a high interest rate market actually create um, in the in the real estate world. And that is, it does pull a lot of buyers out of the market. Um, it does allow for more homes to be sitting around. So you have less pool of buyers making offers on your property as a seller. Um, but that creates a, a buy opportunity for, for buyers, especially first-time buyers who are trying to get in the market. Um, so you have less competition now than you would if the rates were lower. Um, you have more negotiating power as a buyer than if rates were lower. Um, so all that yields to a, a, you know a, a, a much better position for a buyer to go in uh, to make offers on properties and ask for credits, ask for the seller to do uh, temporary buy downs, which are very big right now to help drive that interest rate down. Um, you know we're seeing a lot of price reductions, for example, as well. Now you know, albeit we don't have a huge amount of inventory. But we also have a huge amount of buyers. You know, the, the recent study was like 65% of all potential buyers are sitting on the sidelines right now. And I think it's a big mistake because if you do the math, and I've done the math multiple times for buyers, if you do the math and look at a scenario where you're buying a property 
at current pricing with a higher interest rate versus waiting, you know, eight to 12 months for interest rates to come down, that same property in a lower interest rate market is going to be about 20% higher in value. Um, and so when you run the numbers, then the day it's all about the math, right? What, what are, what is our payment going to be? You run the numbers, it's actually less expensive to buy now versus later, right? Um, and then the two, the two, you know, wins there is number one, when you buy now, you know, you'll have equity in 12 to 18 months because as rates come down, more buyers come in the market, you're going to have much more competition. Prices are going to go up. So you have that equity that's going to be generated. Plus, you're going to have the ability to refinance when rates come down. You won't have that ability if you buy in 12 months. So we, we talk about, you know, you can change the rate. You can't change what you buy the house for. And that's, that's, that's you know, it's extremely true in this, in this current market. So I always say, if you find the right place and it you fits your budget, this is the time to buy before rates start to come down. So it behooves them to get into it and then perhaps refinance at a later date. Absolutely. Anyone has bought this year, last year, and maybe even the year before is going to benefit from a refinance in the near future. So they have to make sure they're getting a loan with a no prepayment penalty then. These days, 30 year fixed conforming loans or jumbo loans are going to be are going to come without a prepayment penalty. But you definitely want to make sure that absolutely um, when you uh, when you sign up with your lender. OK, and next, what are the three biggest mistakes first time home buyers do? while applying for a loan while looking for a home yeah so obviously there's my list is probably 20 you know 20 deep but i you know the top three i would say is number one is they don't get pre-approved early enough and that's a huge mistake that i've seen i'm seeing more and more um in this current market and what i mean by that is you know you decide you want to shop for a home or you decide that you want to purchase a home the very first thing you should do is figure out what you can afford um, and figure out what your buying power is uh, and figure out, are you ready to buy today or do you need to wait a six, six months? You know, um, you know, lending guidelines are constantly changing. And even for some of us who are seasoned veterans in the industry, it's always a challenge to try to, you know, to stay on top of what those guidelines are. So it is absolutely critical that as a first time buyer, the first thing you do is get pre-approved Talk to a lender who you trust and figure out what your buying power is. And it's not just having a conversation on the phone and then saying, okay, I can afford this. I'm going to go start shopping for a house. When I say pre-approved, I mean, submit the application, have your credit pulled, you know, provide tax returns or pay stubs or whatever the lender is asking for to verify your income and assets, and then understand exactly what the payment would look like before you go out there and start shopping. What I'm seeing a lot of is people who are saying, well, when I find a house I like, I'll go ahead and submit the application at that point in time. And unfortunately, the problem with that is, you know, given the limited inventory that we have, even though, you know, there's not a lot of buyers in the market today, there are still competitive offers going around, especially if the property is hot, that if you're just scrambling last minute to try to submit an offer and you don't have financing on the table, you're, you're, you're going to lose. You're going to lose every single time. So it's never too early to start. And you know, with us at least, it's a soft credit pull, so there's really no downside to trying to start the process early. And by early, I mean you know, don't be afraid to start two, three months before you actually feel that you're going to be ready to make the move. So, how long does that last for? Is it valid for the, this pre-qualification? Six months, a year? Yeah. So the pre-approval typically lasts for as long as the credit report is valid, and typically that means. 90 to 120 days is the average amount of time that you'll you'll have a pre-approval good for. But keeping it fresh, you know, uh, and keeping it current is pretty easy. You know, it's a matter of updating pay stubs, maybe doing another soft credit poll. Uh, we can keep it going for for quite some time. A person comes to you and they're first time home buyer. What do they need to come in with? What kind of paperwork do they need to start prepping for? Yeah, so this is another mistake people make is I, you know, a lot of buyers will default to going to their local bank or whoever they bank with to get a mortgage. And unfortunately, you know, banks are not really built for mortgages. They're not a mortgage company. You know, they 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 are a depository. They make money off your deposits, off selling your credit cards, fees, things like that. Certainly they offer mortgages as well. 
it's low hanging fruit for them. But, you know, you know, if, if you had to do heart surgery, for example, would you go to a general doctor or would you go to a heart surgeon? You know, so, you know, you want to work with someone who specializes in mortgages, whose company is all encompassing mortgage. And that's all that we do, for example. So one of the mistakes is don't just go to your bank, talk to a mortgage banker or a mortgage lender as well. They typically have better interest rates, better programs and give you much better service and speed than, than your bank does. But, but to your question though, it depends, right? Every, every individual is different. So depending on whether they're self-employed, for example, whether they're a W-2 employee, um, it could be as simple as two pay stubs, W-2s and bank statements. I guess I'm going to bring it back home now to Los Angeles, yeah. or Hollywood. Most people or a lot of people here are writers in the entertainment industry. Sure. They don't have these, you know, W-9s that you need, W-2s that you need. They're on 1099s. How does that work? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, 55% of my business, maybe even 60% of my business is all self-employed individuals. And a good portion of those are people in entertainment, you know, living right here in LA. You know, I do a lot of work with writers, editors, behind the scenes, um, or even in front of the camera. So, you know, most people in entertainment, for example, earn a W-2, but they earn a W-2 from multiple sources. So they're still considered, they're not really a full-time employee. They're what we call a variable W-2 uh, or contract-based employer. Um, but even those who are receiving 1099s, like yourself, for example, real estate agents, for example, are, are 1099, you know, contractors, you know, those people, you know, it is more challenging to qualify for a loan because we're basing your income on your net income on the tax returns, not on what you gross, but what you net. And, you know, as, as you know, you know, we love to write off as much as we can and minimize what we give to Uncle Sam. And so typically we're showing little income. On our tax returns, which you know makes it more challenging uh, if if you're self-employed. So again, this is more reason why preparing ahead of time to get pre-approved is is critical because in some cases you may have to wait an additional year to file the right tax return in order to qualify. And you know that's where we we come in. We definitely do a lot of handholding. We help people look at their taxes and strategize on what the taxes should look like for the upcoming year. Uh, for example, to qualify for that, you know, for that, for that property. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, LA definitely is, is very different than most parts of the country because we have such a high number of self-employed individuals here. I remember when I was applying for a loan, cause I, you, I come to this business as an investor yeah. and um, I was not able to show obviously any pay stubs. I only had 1099s cause those yeah. were the jobs I had. And I mentioned to my lender, I said, so I would have been more qualified to get a loan if I was a minimum wage person at McDonald's yep. getting a weekly check than, you know, making over a hundred thousand a year, let's say. And they were, they said, yeah, yep. they, that's what they need. So, so going back, I don't want to let go of this too much. I don't want to drag yep. onto this too much, but also I don't want to let go of it since this is a very, you know, entertainment driven market. Yeah. How, what do you need to look at? other aside from our 1099s what if there's a million dollars in your savings account like what are you looking for yeah so again you know again th this is I, I can't stress enough the value of a mortgage lender uh, versus the bank is we have such a large variety of programs and products that cater to different demographics and different you know backgrounds in terms of income and you know and careers so, you know, again, so if we say as a self-employed individuals, we look at, you know, on average two years of tax returns. And in some cases, people say, I can't show that. I had a horrible year last year, or I wrote too much off, and I'm either showing no income or in some cases a loss, a negative income, if you would, uh, which doesn't doesn't help. So if we can't go the tradi traditional route of using tax returns, um, we have other products that are specifically designed for that type of individual. Um, and we could look at assets in the bank, right? We can do what's called an asset-based loan, where we take, you know, the, depending on the age of the individual and how much bank assets we're talking about, we can convert those assets assets to a monthly income mm -hmm. and in some cases qualify them based on, on just that, right? But, you know, we don't all have, you know, five, six, seven million dollars in the bank to do that in most cases. And so we look at a, a different route, which uh, what we call non-QM products or non-qualified mortgages, which are very big right now. In fact, I think in 2024, they're likely going to be probably the most popular 
sort of out of the box type products out there. What's it called again? So, so we, we we categorize those as non QM or non qualified mortgages. Okay. Right. Uh, qualified mortgage being you know like a thirty year fixed you know conforming Fannie Mae Freddie Mac or typical you know conforming jumbo product. Um, a non a non QM product is a non qualified mortgage, and those would be things like a bank statement loan. So we, we'll look at instead of tax returns, we'll look at twelve months of your business statement deposits to average those numbers and qualify you based on that instead of looking at your tax returns, right? Um, that's one example. Another example could be a limited doc loan or a, you know what we used to call a, a you know a no doc product um, where again it's based on your credit score, reserves, and um, your down payment as well, right? Uh, there's also products for investors where we look at the rent role on the property instead of on the income. Um, so there's a lot of creative stuff out there that can help people qualify if we can't use traditional route. Um, but again, some of those require a little more prepping and, and you know, for, and so it's, it's, it's always best to start the process early, early on. So with those alternatives, they would be at a higher interest rate, wouldn't they? You wouldn't come in at the seven ish interest rate. Well, interesting enough, um, in this current market now, we're seeing that those non QM products for like the, the bank statement loan, which is very popular. I, I do quite a bit of those. The the current interest rate on a bank statement loan today for a 30 year fixed is between 6.875 and 7.125, which is right in line with where the 30 year fixed is on a traditional mortgage. So uh, the big difference, however, though, is typically those non-QM products will come with additional fees and points uh, to secure that a kind of loan like that. But again, they're still reasonably priced where, you know, for the opportunity to be able to purchase today versus in 12 months or 24 months, it makes sense. So first time home buyers are bombarded with so many different lending terms, mortgage banker, mor mortgage broker, late night commercials, lending tree, and all these things that are totally in your face. Yeah. What's the difference between a mortgage banker a broker? Are you a broker or a banker? How does this work? Sure. So great question. Um, you know, and I, I do a lot of classes. I teach a lot of classes to my agents. And one of the first slides I talk about is understanding, you know, what I do as a, as a, as a mortgage banker or mortgage lender. Um, and how does that compare to going to your local bank, for example, or working with a, with a broker, if you would. Um, so let's put it out of the way. A broker is literally someone sort of like a middleman, right? They, they act sort of as, as someone who takes the application um, but they don't actually do any processing or underwriting of, of, of the work. They they take the application and then they act as a middle person and send the file to a third party, um, to a, a an investor or a lender that they work with, who then underwrites the file. Right. That's what a, that's what a, what a broker sort of sort of does. So you're gonna you know so generally speaking, because there's a middleman involved, you're typically gonna pay more. You're not gonna get a personalized service because the control of the file is out of their hands. Right. It's with another another company, uh, so that's that's you know sort of short and short what a, what a broker would do. Uh, the bank, um, your local bank, pick whichever one when you want. For example, um, will will act as a, a direct lender, meaning they're going to process the file, they're going to underwrite the file, and they're going to fund the file. And in many cases, they're going to also going to service the file as well, right? The problem with the banks is is again they're not a mortgage company, and so the efficiency factor there. Is not always going to be in your favor. Um, you know, you've got underwriting. You know, uh, call centers probably throughout the country. They're not going to be local. Uh, they generate a lot of volume because people sort of default to going there. And so the service you get up front, the due diligence, if you would, in qualifying that file, is not going to be always. It's not always going to be there. And I say that because thirty-five percent of my business comes from fallouts from larger banks. And that's because a lot of them get pushed through, they get rushed through, and you don't find out whether you qualify or not typically until you're in escrow and in front of an underwriter where it's almost too late and now you have to back out or try to scramble to figure something out. So that sort of a bank is a direct lender in that sense. Um, but they have a small sandbox to play with, right? They have a very limited amount of, of products to service the, the clients, typically 30 year fix, maybe an arm, but they're not gonna offer the non-QM products. They're not gonna be able to cater to like foreign nationals things like that. So, so in comes what I do, which I am first and foremost, a direct lender. And by definition, that means I'm processing the file, I'm underwriting the file, and I'm funding the file 
all in-house with our own money. That's okay? amazing. Uh, the big difference, though, of course, is I have a huge sandbox to play with because we're not just one bank. We're what we call a correspondence, meaning we underwrite for multiple investors, which could include some of the larger banks out there as well. Um, but we have multiple options. Every bank may have different guidelines. You know, you may fit a certain guideline that is not offered by a local bank. But because I have such an array of different products, you know, 40, 50 different investors, we can target a specific investor to get the best rate but also one that fits your particular scenario uh, to make the deal work. So you're getting the best of both worlds. We can shop multiple investors and still offer a wide range of products, plus get the speed, the efficiency, and as well as the service throughout the process that you won't find elsewhere. Great answer. Um, I would like to continue our conversation in our next chat, which will be probably in a few weeks. Yep. And uh, definitely continue this. And again, focus on first time home buyers because I feel that right now they're the most scared and they need your guidance. Are your services available nationwide? Yeah, we're, we're licensed in all 50 states. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, first time home buyer in LA is very different than a first time home buyer in the Midwest, right? And so different programs will cater to different people. Uh, but again, being educated, understanding what's available out there, there's a lot of programs out there that may or may not fit. Um, talking to someone who knows the products and can guide the, the clients to the right product for them, it's, it's going to be really key. Amazing. Well, yep. to be continued. Well, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.